My name is Trent Van Epps. I am a member of the Protocol Guild, and that's who I'm here as a member of. Uh, however, I do work full-time for the Ethereum Foundation doing um, coordination around network upgrades. Um, yeah, that's the kind of work I do there. And today I'm presenting uh, funding Ethereum with the Protocol Guild. Um, but before we jump into it, of course, thank you to the organizers for inviting me and allowing me to share this project with everybody. I really appreciate it. So we'll start with some broader context about what Ethereum is and what are its public goods. So if you're not aware, Ethereum is a globally distributed computer that anyone can use. It's, it's a blockchain. Uh, and this means that Ethereum, the network, and the EVM generally, the Ethereum virtual machine, are really fundamental public infrastructure for uh, the people that use it, uh, sending transactions, people who are deploying smart contracts, people who are building companies. Uh, anybody who's building on top of Ethereum counts on it as an important public good for them. Uh, and there are four main areas that I'd say make up the, the maintenance and support network for uh, what this network is, and I'll just go through them quickly here. So there's the research, the, uh, the work that's done to evolve the protocol, figure out where it should go in the future. There are the clients. These are, you know, they're the implementations of the, the Ethereum protocol in a specific language. This is what is commonly referred to as like a node. If you're running a node, you're running a specific client version. Uh, and then there's the coordination. This is the work that I'm involved in, and many others uh, contribute to this. So figuring out what the protocol is going to look like in the future and how we get there, uh, engaging the broader ecosystem in this evolutionary process to figure out when an upgrade should take place, um, the, the kinds of features that we want to be including in the next upgrade, things like that. And then finally, there's, there's tooling. So the languages that smart contract developers use to actually create applications that people then interact with. Uh, so these are the four main areas. Uh, the four buckets of things that support these public goods and the network itself. So we can move into talking about how these are actually funded. Uh, you may be aware of the largest one, which is the Ethereum Foundation. Um, it distributes tens of millions throughout the ecosystem every year through what's called the ESP, the Ecosystem Support Program. Uh, they do uh, amazing work engaging with the ecosystem, finding out what needs to be funded, and then getting funds to these people who are actually doing the work and um, you know, uh, constructively engaging with um, the work that needs to be done. And one of, the, one of the programs that they run is the Client Incentive Program, uh, which gives a chunk of ETH to client teams, people who are developing the node software, and it allows them to run validators and participate in proof of stake. Um, and this unlocks over a few years. And then there's other, other names here. Gitcoin, CLR Fund, Giveth, and Optimism. These are organizations that exist within the community that run, uh, every quarter they'll run a matching round that allows community members to uh, fund these grants. And then there's a matching pool which um, then boosts that uh, funding amount. Um, so these are, these are kind of the, the big ones. There's a couple more listed on this slide. And many, many more, which I, I don't have the time to get into. But it really underscores the fact that uh, Ethereum has a really rich diversity of funding options for public goods and different mechanisms that are we're able to experiment with. And I think this is probably one of the my, one of my favorite parts of the community is that we're so willing to experiment and try out new things and engage with. Uh, different mechanisms to fund the people that are actually working on important public infrastructure. Uh, Kevin Owaki likes to say public goods are good, so I'll add a little uh, extension to it, is that having many community mechanisms to fund public goods is actually also very good. Um, for one, it decentralizes power and influence. Uh, it prevents this power from being siloed for a single allocator. For example, the EF uh, doesn't want to be controlling all the funds that are going out into the ecosystem. They'd much rather disperse this control out. Um, when we're funding public goods ourselves, we're, we're participating in this process. It helps to remind us of our agency and uh, gives a bit of intra-community engagement, having these different groups interact with each other. And then finally, it, it helps us celebrate the pluralism that I think Ethereum is, is a core value of the Ethereum community when we have a variety of approaches. However, uh, existing mechanisms, 
the, the, the ones I mentioned on the previous slide, they often face similar limitations, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through those limitations in a bit. Uh, so in light of this, um, I'll dive into like the framing for what the protocol guild is and, and the inspiration for where it came from. So this question of what mechanism can help us better retain talent and fund the core protocol contributors? This is not necessarily a new question, uh, especially not if you consider broader public goods. These, this is a, something that's been discussed for many, many years and in, in crypto and Ethereum uh, for years as well, figuring out how do we incentivize people to you know, commit to working on this stuff that's super important that many, many people are building on top of. Um, and it, uh, the discussion came up again last November. Um, and I, myself and a bunch of other people who work on the core protocol decided to take a swing at this and, and think about uh, what sort of mechanism would best serve this, this purpose. So as we were going through the discussion process, we settled on three main challenges that we wanted to address in this mechanism, um, which ended up being the protocol guild. And so I'll go through these three here, as well as uh, what we responded to the challenges with, the specific features that we wanted to include. So their curation is hard, incentives are imbalanced, and contributor churn is bad. It, it has negative effects. So the first one, curation is really hard. Um, Applications, layer twos, whales, and individuals, they all want to sponsor the core protocol, um, but knowing where to send money is, is really hard. Uh, there's no single mechanism that gathers everybody who's working on a client or doing research or doing this, this coordinating activity. There's no single mechanism that somebody can just send some assets to, and then they're, you know, they, they have confidence that it's going to end up in the right hands. Um, you know, there, there are, like I said, there's existing funding mechanisms that do some of this, but uh, there's often, it, it, it's a patchwork of different solutions and they, they end up missing some key contributors. So what we wanted to respond to in, in the design of this mechanism was we should just create a single address, a contract which uh, represents many addresses that people can just send to. And then uh, we'll take this list, uh, the list of addresses and individuals who opt into this, we'll put it on chain and start to build norms around you know, the broader community uh, giving financial contributions to this contract. Um, and so going back to the other side, the, the, the follow-on challenge is like, protocol contributors are very interested in a you know, uh, broader funding mechanism uh, that, that's specifically tailored to their work, uh, as well as token upside, but there's no existing structure. So again, put it on chain and start to build norms around uh, people contributing to this. The second challenge related to curation is that existing solutions, um, you know, among the variety that we have today, they usually favor teams and they don't do the best job surfacing all contributors uh, that are actually doing the work. Um, you know, teams are much easier to curate if you have uh, five people per team. It's much easier to just find the one address that corresponds roughly with the people who are doing the work rather than drilling down into the individual level and, and finding an address you know, to send to. Uh, so the way we wanted to respond to this when we're, again, designing the protocol guild uh, was have the members themselves self-curate. And this is really important. I'll get into it more later. But self-curation, we think, is, is the, the best way to drill down into a domain that has experts doing work. And they can uh, make sure that anybody who's, who's involved in this key protocol work is actually being included in the mechanism. And crucially, we want to give individuals uh, agency and make sure that they're the base unit. Um, so we're surfacing part-time contributors, people who aren't interested in you know, marketing themselves during a matching round, for example, or people who just don't have time uh, to be engaged with these processes. The second big challenge is that the incentives are imbalanced. Um, so uh, financial incentives are usually skewed towards newer projects that have tokens. Um, Ethereum doesn't, isn't launching new, so you have people who have been contributing for years. They may have had earlier exposure, but today, somebody who's just joining uh, isn't going to have the same exposure to working on the base layer as somebody who's starting a new application or uh, a new L2 or even another layer one. Uh, this is just sort of the reality of the context that we're working in. Um, and of course, I, I want to say we don't fault people or projects for using leveraging financial incentives uh, to, or weighting them appropriately. Um, this is just sort of the context that we have to deal with. Uh, so 
the response that we wanted to build into this mechanism is that we should generally increase financial incentives available to contributors with the caveat of, uh, of course, financial incentives aren't the only or best motivation for people. We think it's just one tool in the tool set that's under leveraged. Um, the second challenge underneath this, this incentive question is the existing solutions may not target tokens and the associated upside that could come from having a basket of tokens that's allocated to core contributors. Uh, so the second response is that we'll nudge the incentive balance back to the protocol a bit and again, build norms around sponsors and projects sharing a percent of their tokens uh, at launch or you know, some recurring revenue back to the core protocol. And like I said, financial motivations are one thing, but we think that this also has an important psychological effect of core contributors understand that the broader network is interested in their well-being and they, under, they, they have this uh, awareness that the people that are building on top of their foundational infrastructure, they care about their, their incentives for the long term. And then the final challenge is that contributor churn is bad. It, it has negative effects. Um, core protocol work is, is a very much a niche area uh, for people to contribute. It can take quite a while for somebody to uh, join a client team and start contributing, you know, often six months to nine months. They're just understanding the code base, figuring out where they can best contribute. It's, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and that's totally fine. Again, it's just the reality of the context for core protocol work. So what we wanted to do is that membership eligibility for the protocol guild mechanism only happens after six months of regular contributions. Uh, and this weight is then included in the, the final allocation. And then secondly, we wanted assets to vest in order to help knowledge transfer between cohorts. If you have somebody who's been around for five years, uh, and they're working with somebody who just joined within the last year, we want to be able to keep them around to transfer that important institutional knowledge about how to do a specific work related to the core protocol. Uh, and we, we think that vesting is, is a good first approach to figure out how to get that institutional knowledge to transfer between these different cohorts. And then secondly, contributor value grows over time. But once you're an expert, there's less incentives to stick around. There may be more attractive opportunities. Um, and so our response to that is we should time weight allocations. Again, uh, there's a bit of yin and yang balance here. We want to recognize that new contributors should be valued, but there's uh, also a consideration for people who have been around years and accumulated a lot of this important knowledge. So uh, if you've been around longer, you'll have a more significant weight in the set. As you may have guessed from these, we created the Protocol Guild, uh, which is a collective of 110 Ethereum contributors who actively maintain an on-chain membership registry. And again, in the, in the, the four main areas I mentioned at the, uh, the first slide. Um, and this, this on-chain registry allows ecosystem sponsors to directly fund our work and the public goods that everybody else depends on they're building throughout the stack. Uh, and this is just a simple diagram showing sponsors will send an asset, some recurring revenue stream. It could be governance tokens. Um, uh, it could be fractionalized NFTs. Uh, pretty much any asset besides individual NFTs to this vesting contract. Uh, over time, it'll then be distributed to the weighted registry and directly to the people who are actually doing this work. And the key thing about the registry is that it's consistently updated so that people don't have to worry about, you know, does this represent the core contributor set from a year ago? Does it represent the core contributor set uh, from six months ago or today? And so we want to make sure it's actively maintained so people can come to depend on it as a reasonably updated uh, mechanism. So I'll dive into some of the details about how this thing actually works and how we operate it. Um, so I've, I've mentioned waiting a few times. And one of the larger goals we wanted to focus on when we're uh, considering how to operate this is to reduce the number of knobs or things that the, uh, the members have to um, tweak or modify throughout the operation of this mechanism. And that's for a couple reasons. One, um, it's less contentious if you don't have to decide, you know, I'm waiting myself X and you Y. There's gonna be, it's gonna be contentious if you have to continually rank other people against each other. Um, so it, it, it allows us to have a, uh, a workable waiting system without uh, spending too much time actually figuring out what this waiting system should be. Um, and secondly, uh, as I've mentioned, 
the core protocol contributors are already very much engaged in maintaining and evolving the Ethereum, the base layer, and spending time working on, you know, fiddling with little knobs here and there isn't in our best interest, and it's not in the best interest of everybody else throughout the stack. So we went with a very simple uh, weighting mechanism. It's the square root of the total months you've been contributing multiplied by a time weight, whether it's full-time or part-time. And the square root has a nice effect of uh, compressing the range a little bit. Uh, so there's not this massive disparity between somebody who just joined versus somebody who's been on for many years. Uh, and you can see in these two graphs the effect of using a time weighting mechanism versus a subjective peer ranking mechanism. Uh, you can see in the blue, that's at the start of a, a one year pilot. And then in the red, you'll see it normalizes over time. So again, you have a more equitable distribution of any assets that are sent to this uh, protocol guild mechanism. Regarding eligibility and self-curation, again, this is uh, the four areas, a meaningful contribution to the core protocol, uh, whether you're doing research, whether you are working on a client, coordinating or tooling, uh, it, it has to be a meaningful contribution for at least six months, again, to reduce churn and make sure that people that are actually committed to this idea before we include them on chain in the protocol. And then I'll touch on self-curation a little bit. Uh, I think this is one of the most important aspects of the mechanism because you get the, uh, the insight of people who are domain experts who are directly involved in doing the work and you can avoid dependence on an external uh, curation mechanism, uh, whether it's uh, quadratic funding or some, some council of people who are evaluating these, the individuals who are doing the work. It's much more effective to have the people who are engaged directly in it to say, oh yes, uh, this is my colleague, I work with him on X and Y, and yes, they should be included in uh, this mechanism for, you know, for this weight. And we think this is incentive compatible for two reasons. Um, adding new members dilutes existing ones, so you don't have to worry about, I'm not going to add somebody in my family or you know, a random person because it directly removes uh, financial benefits from accruing to me. Um, however, the all eligible con contributors have to be added to this mechanism. If you're contributing, you should be added uh, in order for this to maintain its legitimacy to the broader community. So the ecosystem of sponsors, people who are uh, just broadly uh, engaged in the community, if they start to distrust that uh, this is actually representative of people who are doing core protocol work, the entire thing loses its legitimacy. So we, we think that these two mechanisms are adequately balanced against each other, and um, hopefully that holds uh, while, we're, while we're operating it in the wild. So we've taken all of these, um, these features and learnings from the engaging with funding mechanisms over the years and um, framed this, this protocol guild mechanism. And we're taking all those learnings and running a one-year pilot. It's already in, in progress now. We have contracts deployed. And uh, we're targeting $10 million in sponsoring assets, which, uh, which will vest for one year. Um, and we've started to bootstrap the mechanism. Uh, we've started by plugging into existing funding infrastructure. So this means um, proposals to Lido, ENS, and Uniswap. Uh, these are prominent uh, Ethereum applications that we've gone and gone through the governance process and uh, talked to their communities, figure out what the best fit amount is, and uh, then secured $5 million from them. Most of this is already in the contract vesting, and then the Uniswap, um, the Uniswap allocation is, should be there in the next few days. Uh, and we've also plugged into the Gitcoin matching rounds, and it's it's been successful. And uh, we've secured 100 100,000 from two Gitcoin matching rounds so far. And we plan to use uh, other ones like Optimism's upcoming upcoming uh, retroactive funding rounds. We think this is the perfect, uh, maybe not perfect, but it's it's very well suited for Optimism's uh, looking back, seeing who's been contributing. Um, and it, just from these three examples, we've been thrilled to see that the community actually uh, resonates with what we're proposing. They think it's valuable to give back to the core protocol, and um, it's just been really exciting to see people understand what we're building here for the long term. Uh, however, we, what we want to do for many years into the future is start to build a norm around allocating a percent of an initial token supply. Uh, or annual revenue. Um, we think this is 
the the way that we're really going to be able to scale up to the incentive size that we want to you know 10 million is is great but if we really want to balance the incentives against somebody deciding to you know join a uh join a new layer to where they can get equity and a significant uh, token allocation uh, this mechanism is going to have to hold much more than just $10 million. So in the future, we want to scale it up. And the, the main way we think of doing that is by building a norm around if you have a new project that's launching, try to allocate uh, some percentage directly to this. And that way we can uh, start to uh, superpower this, this flywheel a little bit better because we don't have to be uh, approaching uh, protocols and companies that are building every single time it happens. Um, and we really look to Gitcoin as the company that's built the flywheel on their own or the protocol. They've, they've built uh, this, this norm around quarterly allocations, around the, the matching uh, process, and um, hope that we can do something similar along that. Again, plugging into these existing funding infra infrastructures where we can. Uh, and post pilot, you know, this is going to run for 12 months. You can, you can check this link here if you're curious about how we're going about it, but we're really serious about uh, defining and evaluating outcomes. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we take our learnings from this one-year pilot and then tweak the mechanism for the next version. Uh, we'll probably be scaling it up even further because this first version is, um, it's, it's relatively limited in, in who the scope of people that are eligible. We want to make sure we're getting all the people who are uh, building key core protocol mechanisms uh, to be included in the protocol guild. Um, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to jump back, um, uh, in building this norm around allocating a percent, uh, we're very excited that there have been some projects that have already given us a percent of their initial allocation. So the, the flywheel is starting to turn, um, and we hope that this will increase in the future. So shout out to true freeze, Gnosis safe and texture punks, which is an NFT project, which has committed to allocating a, a percent of the sale in ETH back to this mechanism. Um, yeah, and so we, we plan to scale this up, like I said, and in the future it will target, we're hoping, um, somewhere around 100 million to start to balance the incentives between working on an application or a new L2, a new L1, to uh, really starting to give back to the people and, and giving them sustainable funding sources uh, for many years to come. And this, this next version of the Protocol Guild will probably have a vest that lasts four years uh, is what we're thinking. So that was a pretty rapid fire. I have no idea how quickly I went through that. Um, maybe we have time for questions. Uh, but if you are curious about learning more, uh, snap a shot of that QR code. And um, if you're interested in sponsoring, so if you're part of a project that uh, is looking to become part of the Regen Alliance, I guess um, Scott was talking earlier that there's no official membership. But I guess the Protocol Guild is uh, an unofficial member of this unofficial organization. Uh, the Regen Alliance. So if you're interested in sponsoring, please reach out to any of the members um, listed in our docs, or actually you can just send permissionlessly. This is a smart contract that anybody can send to, and it will vest autonomously and go directly to the, the members who are listed on the split. Um, but of course, we're, we're more than happy to answer questions and explain how this mechanism works uh, for line of the vision for long term. Um, that's all I have. Those two links are, are me on Twitter and Telegram if you have any questions and want to talk to me directly. And then you can follow us at Protocol Guild. Thank you.